Hi, everybody. My name is Hafa Lombardino, and this is Translation Confessional. How I Learned Spanish Despite the fact that Brazil is surrounded by Spanish-speaking countries, and even though many people believe Portuguese and Spanish to be essentially the same language, I'm here today to assure you that, no, they are only close enough to get you in trouble, but they are two completely separate languages. I've already addressed the subject quickly on episode 8, No Means No, but I wanted to go a little deeper into it as I tell you how I started learning Spanish. Unless you're from the region or study matters related to foreign trade, there's a great chance you've never heard about the southern common market, known as Mercosul in Brazil and Mercosur in Spanish. It is a South American trade bloc created in the early 1990s, and it was originally made up by Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Other nations later joined as observer countries. Its official languages are Spanish, Portuguese, and Guarani. Well, the reason I'm telling you all this is that, considering the economic advantage that knowing these languages would represent to the future workforce in the region, learning Spanish became essential in Brazil in the 1990s. English was the default foreign language in Brazilian schools, and kids learn it from a very young age, as I mentioned in episode 6, How I Learned English. So, it was only natural that parents who could afford to send their kids to language schools would do so to try to give them a competitive edge when the time came for us young Brazilians to find a good job, hopefully in a large company where our language skills would be needed to close multi-million dollar deals. The school where I was already learning English soon started offering Spanish classes too. I was 15 when I had my first Spanish class and I was thrilled about having the opportunity to learn a new language. While learning the mechanics of Spanish came easily to me, I never became fluent because I was already in high school and working towards a professional degree in computer sciences, which meant that I took extra classes compared to regular high schoolers. And on top of that, I had to participate in an internship program to get my professional degree. So besides regular classes in the morning, internship in the afternoon and evenings, alternated with English classes twice a week, I only got to dedicate most of my available time to Spanish during my 90-minute Saturday classes. I simply could not afford to spend all my time daydreaming about Spanish, as I had had the opportunity to do with English when I was still in elementary and middle school. Because I'm a nerd, I did try to squeeze in some independent study here and there. As he had done to help me with my English skills a few years earlier, my dad bought a complete set of books and tapes for Spanish learners one installment at a time, putting a few extra bucks in to get each issue with his Sunday paper. The entire set was in Spanish from Spain. Luckily, my very first teacher was a young Spaniard who moved to Brazil to teach Spanish. Considering that, there was no way I wouldn't have the Spain accent, lisp and all, as the default in my brain and the perfection I would forever try to achieve and fail as a Spanish student. That Spaniard teacher was also responsible for introducing me to my favorite rock band in Spanish. Wait, uh, let me go back for a bit. Like any 1980s kid, I too was a fan of Latin sensations like Menudos, Luis Miguel, and Cheyenne. In 1995, I had a huge crush on Ricky Martin when he released A Medio Vivir, and I became an instant fan of Shakira when she came out with Pies Descalzos that same year. And while I truly appreciate Latin pop and sugary ballads, I only learned that there was such a thing as rock in Espanol when I started taking Spanish classes. So Paulinho, that's how we call Pablo, the teacher from Spain, brought a CD to class one day, which his parents had just sent to him by mail. He was hot off the presses, and he played a song for us to follow along with the lyrics. The name of the song was Avalancha, which was also the name of the album. And the name of the band that would become my favorite Spanish rock band ever was Héroes del Silencio, or Heroes of Silence. I begged Paulinho to let me take the CD home so I could make a cassette tape and listen to it several times a day, every day, while walking to school. Um, By the way, if you have no idea what CDs and cassette tapes are, 
You may be way younger than I am and will never, ever understand how real the struggle was back in the 1980s and 90s when you wanted to listen to your favorite music, but had to wait for it to come on the radio or on MTV if you didn't have the money to buy LPs and CDs just to get your favorite track. There was no such thing as today's in-demand culture with amazing solutions like YouTube and Spotify to satisfy your musical cravings. Anyway, going back to Edois. Avalancha was unfortunately their fourth and last album as a band, right when I first got to know their work. But singer Enrique Bumburi went solo shortly after that. I was really lucky to see him live a couple of years ago at the House of Blues here in San Diego. The house was packed and the line to get in went around the block. He only got to sing one song by Eros, albeit my favorite, La Chispa de Cuada. Still, I was also familiar with a lot of his solo stuff, including the album he was touring then. Actually, in a very happy coincidence, while waiting in line, I ended up meeting a friend and her husband, both from Spain, and I could swear they were giving me some funny looks when I was belting out Cuna de Caín, Bunburi's latest single. Check the episode description for some links to see if you dig his music as well. I'll also add my Spanish rock Spotify playlist into the mix so you can learn more about bands and my new favorite, Vetusta Morla, which I was told is a hipster sensation, but who am I to judge? I could talk about Spanish rock for the rest of the episode, but it would be remiss of me not to mention my other Spanish obsession, Almodóvar. I wasn't old enough yet because I was only 16, but since I looked like I was in my mid-20s already, I got away with getting into my first Almodóvar movie at a local theater. It was Carne Tremola, Live Flash, an adaptation of British author Ruth Rendell's crime novel. I was completely mesmerized by it, So much so that I took my mom to the movies the following weekend so I could see it again and introduce her to my newfound passion. She was scandalized, to say the least, but I was able to turn her around a couple of years later with Todo Sobre Mi Madre, All About My Mother, which she liked very much. Since that fateful day in 1997, when I went to the movies twice to see Live Flash, I've tried to make it to the theater to see every Amadova release. And I've been successful in doing so most often than not. And 22 years later, in 2019, I went back down the same road and saw the same Almodovar movie twice at the theater, Dolor y Gloria, Pain and Glory. And it has since become my favorite movie in Spanish, if not of all time. If I couldn't catch an Almodovar film at the theater, I'd certainly stop everything as soon as it would become available to watch it at home. The same is true about my other movie obsession. Thanks to Live Flash, I got introduced to Javier Bardem and have watched most of his body of work. From obscure movies from the early 1990s to his critically acclaimed performances that English-speaking audiences have come to know. So, I would say that even though I never became fluent in Spanish like I did in English, not to the point that I could present a whole lecture or record a podcast completely in Spanish, I did become a very good consumer of the language. The thing is, I started learning Spanish when I was a little older and had so much on my plate, finishing high school, looking for my first job, and thinking about college. And on top of that, I never had a chance to visit a Spanish-speaking country and spend enough time there to improve my conversational skills. I don't think in Spanish. So I'm able to translate from Spanish into my two languages and have earned a professional certificate in Spanish to English translations from the University of California, San Diego Extension, the same program where I started to teach tools and technology in translation in 2010. Spanish to Portuguese projects are very hard to come by, since most people think that there is no need to translate between the two languages because they're so similar. They only realize that's not the case when something goes wrong, you know. Anyway, I do get a lot of requests from Spanish to English, especially subtitling projects, and have had the pleasure to translate the subtitles of a few series in Spanish, thus catering to my cravings for the Spaniard accent and attempting to translate the very colorful expressions they use, hopefully with the same dose of humor and sarcasm in English. When I did get my first job teaching English at a language school in Brazil and soon started working on translation projects, my plan was to save money to spend some time as an exchange student in Madrid after finishing college. Well, that never happened, because I met my husband in my third year of journalism school, we got married, then I moved here to California, and both our savings went all towards building a new life together, 
The closest I've been to Spain was flying over the country while traveling between Italy and Portugal. One day, though, I'll make my Spanish dream come true in Spain and see life in Almodovar colors in Madrid. Send me an email at rlombardino at wordawareness.com or leave a voice message on my anchor page. If I get enough feedback and voice messages, I can go back to the subject and post a special podcast episode with everyone's opinion on this very same theme. By the way, my anchor page is anchor.fm slash translation dash confessional. I look forward to hearing from you. Stay tuned for weekly episodes and subscribe to Translation Confessional through your favorite podcast app.